This is totally my happy place. Wait, this is your happy place? Mm, yep. I thought you said the uh, candy shop was your happy place. It is. So is the park swings and the petting zoo and watching you mow the lawn. <laughs> is that so? Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about walking the dog? Yep. Okay, uh, the backyard? Yep. <laughs> the cupcake shop? Yep. Uh, no. No, put it back. Put it back, not till we get home. Okay, what about, um... Oh, okay, hold on. Reel it in. Happy place. <laughs> Happy place. <laughs> Happy place. Dad, wake up. Happy place. Happy place. Happy place. Happy place. Happy yeah. place. Place. All right, kiddo, tell me this. How can all these places be your happy place? Dad, anywhere that you are is my happy place. Put it back. Now put your seatbelt on. Amen. Well, good morning. If you would turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 1, and we're going to talk about camping and how our Father in Heaven literally created a campground. Maybe you wouldn't have thought it as much of a camp, as a campground uh, in uh, the book of Exodus, and we find working in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. In fact, I challenge you as you read uh, when Moses' journey, I, w I would challenge you to read it as a, a space where literally God was creating a campground for his people because he wanted his children to camp out with him. But before we do that, I want to um, just kind of uh, introduce you to someone that a lot of you guys um, probably had heard me being praying about. In fact, for almost uh, quite a few months, uh, we were literally believing for life and uh, in a space where the enemy was attacking. And that was my son, Nathan, and he is here today. Nathan, would you please come up here right now? Come on up here, Nate. <laughs> so um, sometimes it's, you know, I, I heard one person you know, come up, you know, said saying in a men's group, he says, I just want to see a miracle. Well, you're looking at one. Yeah, you're looking. <laughs> so, um, all of you guys, uh, if you could just, uh, what we're really doing is I'm trying to help him write his testimony. And then one day soon, he's going to be up here doing this and sharing his testimony because I really believe the Bible says, remember we talk about the blood of the lamb and the word of our our testimony, you can't tell he was even in an accident. You can't tell that he had open brain surgery. You can't tell any of it because God is so, he's our Father in heaven. Thank you, Nathan, for coming. Thank you for coming up here. Love you, buddy. Give him a hand. Amen. For a Father's Day present for me is obviously is, is uh, taking time to be with your kids. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, we're going to talk about how our father literally created a space. Now, I um, grew up in a camper. Um, we would uh, camp up at uh, Brower Park, Big Bend Park, Little Whitefish Lake. And uh, my whole life, I uh, grew up in the space of camping on the weekends. And all of the work, in fact, uh, you can't live out in this side of the west side of Michigan and not see you know, people pulling boats, people pulling campers, people going to all these different uh, events as far as, and camping, what, what I love about camping is you see these men that a lot of times are in their trucks, uh, first of all, they like their trucks pulling their campers or whatever they're doing, and, and what they don't really realize is that what camping does a lot of times is what living in your home doesn't do, is that all of a sudden now you're in a space where you give attention you're you're not working at something you're not doing something in fact i i don't have a camper um i live um i live on a lake 
and I remember when I was uh, getting, when I was going to, when I got married, my wife and I, we made all these different promises, and I, I watched my mom work a, a job on the weekends, and I watched her work so hard at camping that she never had any time to herself, so I said, I looked at my wife, and I said, I'm not, I'm not doing that to you. We're going to live on a lake, or we're not going to be in the water, period. Because I don't want you to pack for two different places and have just to work your life away, and so that was our that was that was our journey. And uh, but I watch all these uh, these men and these fathers spend all this time with their kids, and they don't really realize that that's what the kids want. Just like the video just showed, you know, that's what your father in heaven wants is spending time with him. He wants and longs for that. In fact, the wilderness was literally really was only just a, like an 11 day journey that landed up taking 40 years 40 years in that camping and you know some of you go man I love to camp for 40 years I don't think if you were you you wouldn't be reading the book of Exodus and say you know that's not the camping I would really prefer in a desert but what happened in that space was he was teaching his kids how and who a father really is and that's what we're going to explore today. And then some of you had struggles in your you know, fathering. Some of you weren't raised in spaces. Maybe you had an absent father. Maybe you had an abusive father. Maybe you even had a great father. And, you know, each situation uh, presents its own challenges. And we're going to talk about that today. And then maybe you're, maybe you're uh, here today and... Um, you're, you're not a father. You're, in fact, you're a mother or, or maybe you're a young lady and, and you're struggling because you didn't have a, a father figure in your life. We're going to talk about that. How you respond. Because you know, I know that in my life there are things that are, are, I have to say, I don't want to be an earthly father. I want to be like my heavenly father. My aim isn't to you know, try to look at this world and be as good as the world is. I want to be like my heavenly father in heaven. Amen? All right, so in Deuteronomy chapter 1, here's God setting his people into a place. He's camping with them. In verse 26, it says, But you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God and refused to go in. You complained in your tents and said, The Lord must hate us. That's why he has brought us here from Egypt, to hand us over to the Amorites to be slaughtered. Where can we go? Our brothers have demoralized us with their report. They tell us the people of the land are taller and more powerful than we are, and their towns are large with walls rising high into the sky. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. But I said to you, don't be shocked or afraid of them. The Lord your God is going ahead of you. This is what we learn what a father does. He's going ahead. He will fight for you. Just as you saw him do in Egypt, and you saw how the Lord your God cared for you all the way as you traveled through the wilderness, just as a father cares for his child, now he has brought you to this place. But even after all that he did, you refused to trust the Lord your God, who goes before you looking for the best places to camp, guiding him with a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. Father, Lord, I pray that you help us realize that as earthly fathers or mothers or, or any kind of directive that, Lord, we're going to fail. We're going to make mistakes. There are things, Lord, that um, we're just going to step into wanting the best. And, Lord, all of a sudden it just seems to turn out the worst. God, I'm thankful that we have you. I'm thankful that we have the presence of who you are, that we can be in a wilderness and we can have the greatest camp meeting with you and our kids. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, I, I can remember uh, some examples in my life and uh, some mistakes. I, many of you know that we had uh, seven kids, and so I made a custom bike rack. A custom bike rack, which means it uh, telescoped up and it would hold three bikes, uh, you know, or four, no, four bikes on the top and five bikes on the bottom, and it would still haul a boat behind it. So I still had a hitch, and I remember um, when we had a, a I a, um, bought a motorhome, um, 
it, at the time bought a used motor home because it was the best way to travel. We would take the motor home to Menards because we had nine people. How many vehicles hold nine people? So we'd take the camper, that was before gas was $3.60, all right? But we'd take the camper, and I, I remember uh, one journey, we went up, up north. Um, I, I don't remember where we were going specifically, what lake we went to, but we took the bikes and we took the ski boat with us. And uh, um, we were in our journey, and all of a sudden, you know, people, the kids all have, and the mother has a desire inside of them, and they saw a, a, a strawberry uh, like some strawberries on the side of the road or uh, on the, off the highway. And we're driving, well, I'm hauling, I mean, I'm hauling nine bikes and a boat behind me with a motorhome and I'm in, right? So I got a long passage to go through and the wife goes, I'd like, to sun, I'd like some strawberries. And the kids go, yeah, I want some strawberries, I want some strawberries, strawberries too. So I'm, me being the pleaser that I am, not in the, the person who doesn't think, all right? So all of a sudden we, Verge off to get the exit off, and, and we're going to go get these strawberries. And then, you know, and then we, you know, and we take this corner, and then here's the, the place. There's no place to turn around. So I try to do a U turn in the road. Okay? I mean, I don't have an off road four wheel drive here. I just have a big old. Can't. So, anyway, what happens is I do this, you know, as well as I do, the, the, when you get off the road, there's slopes and there's valleys and stuff. And the camper, all of a sudden, the back end of it which sits way off the tires all of a sudden gets hung up on the hitch so now I have the boat in the road the camper in the road my butt and so I like every great man is and does is I have pride issues any man have pride issues if you don't have pride issues I don't even know you I don't even know if you're a dude all right so so anyway, I have these pride issues. And so what I do is I go, I take the immediate thing. I go, honey, get in the driver's seat. It's <laughs> exactly what I did. She didn't even know why. She thought she was going to be part of the solution. I'm thinking, I don't want to be known like I was the idiot driving in this spot. So, so she gets in the driver's seat, and I take a hatchet, and I'm hacking at the road so that I can get my camper out of it and believe it or not we did we hacked at that road with a hatchet got enough asphalt out of the back so i could get the camper out of there unhooked the boat took that off and then had to hook it all back on again and i like to say that that was one of my only dumb mistakes but i got a lot of them that i can say all right a lot of those situations that we have come into and a lot of those come you guys because um i want to please and then the thing that my heart wants to do is please, and then I go into jerk mode. Anybody know what that mode is? Don't raise your hand. Jerk mode. All of a sudden, I get insecure. I feel stupid. I, I, wanted, I wanted this to turn out to be a strawberry, strawberry haven moment, and it turned into being, you know, the, the day where I'm upset, kids are upset. Every, all the kids are, like, shut down. They're going over there. I can't believe dad is losing it over some strawberries. And then, you know, and the bottom line is, is that this is what God's people were doing in the desert. They were losing it. And not believing that God had a plan, that he was already before them. Our father knows the day before you step into it. He knows the area that you're going to do. He knows the job that you don't even know you even are looking for yet today. He knows what's going to happen when, you, when you're still struggling as a, as a parent. He knows what you're going to be like as a grandparent. Our, our God knows the days and he has fashioned the days. And so little time do we spend camping out with God to realize how we could camp out with our own families. So today as we... Um, Get in God's word. Let's figure out what we should do or could do if we really got into our heavenly father. The Lord has told me so many times, he goes, is you're learning an earthly role and really what you need to realize is what you're in is a heavenly role. If we want God's, if we want God's kingdom on earth as well as it is in heaven, then we should stop studying the earthly role of it and start studying the heavenly role of it. Amen? Number one, the role of a father is laid out for us in the book of Exodus. Egypt is the world that your children are in. They're in a place of slavery. Slavery to 
the struggles of finances, slavery to the systems of when it comes down to health care and health, slavery when it comes to relationship, hardships. They're, they're slaved to the things of this world. You being the heavenly father that you can be, you can get before them and you can lead them into good camp spaces. You need to go before them. God is going to bring miracles. He's going to bring healings. He's going to bring directives. He's going to bring his path in that space. As long as you don't continue to stay in the earthly perspective. Get into the heavenly perspective. Number two, know that this world is a wilderness. Your kids are marching into a wilderness. And sometimes they're acting like they're know-it-alls. Sometimes they're, you know, they're, especially in, the, in those teenage years, and they, they, they just know what they're going to do and how they're going to get there. You need to realize that it's a wilderness. Don't respond to the space of their, their you know, the way they're acting. Our Father didn't, our Heavenly Father didn't change who He was because of God's people acting out the way they did. He still went before them. Know that your prayers make a difference. Your encouragement makes a difference. Your counsel, your boundaries. You need to create boundaries for your kids. Your consequences. You know, I, you know if you ever watch, how many of you ever watched some of the old movies or the family movie? Anybody ever watch some of those old? You know, probably hardly any of you guys do, right? <laughs> well, then you see the difference in the way fathers are or mothers are back in the day. You know, the way I was raised and the way, and, and I don't even know if there was a schooling on it, but the point of it was is that they were trying to break a child. They're trying to make sure that that person's spirit wasn't defiant, wasn't, you know, you know rebellious, wasn't uh, selfish. They were trying to break. Now, how they did it, they weren't training how they do it. So today, instead of doing that, Instead of going over there and, and helping a child realize, look, look, you need to have a broken heart in the space of going, come to your God, not with, hey, I know it all, and I got it all together. My kids don't know it all. Their dad doesn't know it all. Amen? But yet today, we, we, we have the struggle with having a, a relationship with our Father in heaven because we have a struggle with our earthly children having a relationship with their earthly father. Disciplines out the window. Boundaries, consequences. Everybody's a winner. Everybody's doing it right. And you don't really realize that in Isaiah chapter 66, God says, what could we really do that would impress God? I, honestly, it's not about whether my children can impress me because that doesn't matter. What really matters is that their heart is mending and being shaped by a Heavenly Father. And that there are things that my children are going to do better than I ever could. As long as they don't try to be like that. Try to be me. They need to be who they are in Christ. And many times where people are trying, they go, well, that's a good model. That's cool. That's a good model. But if that model should be, I'm trying to be what God's called me to be. I'll never forget there was a, a person um, that was trying to uh, be a builder. And you know, God had called me to be a builder. Not because I'm smart, not because I really knew what I was doing. It's because that's what God asked me to do. And so they see me succeed in it. And so they go, well, I mean, in, in actuality, they're a smarter person than I am. And academically, this person was smarter than I am. And so they thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. They weren't being what God had asked them to be. They were seeing what somebody else could succeed in being. You're going to be the greatest success in God if you're exactly what God's asked you to be. But if you're trying to be something or someone that you're not to be, you're going to struggle through this world because you're literally pulling against what God called you to be. And so now we have a world today is all of a sudden a, a young lady struggling being a female. All of a sudden I'm going to be a cat? Because instead of helping them realize, look, we're all in a struggle. I'm in a struggle. You're in a struggle. I'm in a wilderness. So if I'm in a wilderness, I know that by design, I'm going to struggle finding my way. I need help. 
I need a father in heaven to help me in this wilderness. I need some earthly father that talk like and act like their heavenly father to help me in this wilderness. What I don't need is a bunch of people going over there and throwing fingers and pointing at everybody else that's in the wilderness who's really struggling to find their way because they don't have a heavenly example. Point number three, your involvement in their life is helping them know where to camp. Your involvement in their life is helping them know where to camp. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 31, it says, And you saw how the Lord your God cared for you all along the way as you traveled through the wilderness. Just as your father cares for his child, now he has brought you to this place. But even after all that he did, you refused to trust the Lord your God who goes before you looking for the best places to camp, guiding you with a pillar of fire by night, in a pillar of cloud by day. Some of you have no idea how to have a relationship with a Heavenly Father. You have no idea. And you're struggling live, working through this wilderness, going throughout life, all on your own. You come to church. You, you even get in your Bible, but your perspective is, I'm not good enough. I need, to, I, I need to be good. Because maybe as a child, you thought, well, if I'm just good enough, my daddy will love me. That's not the perspective. Your father loves you whether you've done anything or everything. You don't understand the heavenly father perspective. Number four, the father role is to assist a child to trust you so that they will learn to trust their heavenly father. Earthly fathers, your role is to help a child trust you. That's your role. In Ephesians chapter 6, children obey your parents and the Lord, that is, accept their guidance and discipline as representatives. For this is right. For obedience teaches wisdom and self-discipline. Honor, esteem, value is precious. Your father and your mother and be respectful to them. This is the first commandment with a promise. So that it may be well with you and that you may have a long life on this earth. And fathers, I've done this wrong. Do not provoke your child to anger. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive. Nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of them. But bring them up tenderly with loving kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Point number five, don't get caught in the trap of condemnation. Trying to make, this is for you fathers right now, you men. Don't get caught up in the trap of condemnation, trying to make up for things of the past. This is where Jesus shines. Many years ago, um, there was a young man that was in the praise team. I had no idea that he was an uh, absentee father. Never, I didn't even know he was a father. And he had, he had given his life to Jesus. He had begun to uh, take his journey in the, through the wilderness and love his, his Father in heaven. And as he was doing that, because the Bible says, and we're going to get to it in Malachi, God was turning his heart. Because that's who God is, amen? He starts shaping your heart and chiseling away. And I don't know, maybe it was six months, a year into uh, his ministry, and all of a sudden he came up to me, he goes, Pastor Ron, he says, yeah, I, got, I need to talk to you. I go, okay. He says, um, I have two children that are in a different state. I haven't talked to them in almost a decade. And I don't even know where to start. So we, first thing we did, we got on our knees and we cried together. Because I can't even imagine those children and how broken they are. And I see how broken this father is. And I knew that God says in Malachi, God turns the hearts of the fathers toward the children and the children to the fathers. And now I knew I could see what was going on. I said, well, we're going to pray first. And we're going to pray that, you know what, that you can begin to start making contact. And whether they respond or don't respond, you're going to do the right thing. Fathers, do the right thing. It doesn't matter if the kid responds right back. Do the right thing. And so he did. He wrote letters. And at first they didn't get back with him. And then they started coming back, both of them. 
the son and the daughter made communication. It must have been like six months, close to a year later, after our first prayer and, and contacts later, he came up to me with tears in his eyes. He goes, I'm going to see him. I had kind of, you know, kind of lost touch with what everything. I go, you're going to see what? He said, I'm going to see my son and my daughter. And man, we, again, we got on our knees and we just cried together. Because God is so good because an earthly father started acting like a heavenly father. It's never too late. It's never too late. God did not, nor did his children hold all of the things that had gone wrong or hadn't gone wrong in the past. That's what grace is. You guys realize the power of grace is? God's grace showed up so miraculously in that situation. So today I want to finish up four different ways we find ourselves comparing. We, we, we do this. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, even though we know it's to be true, he who compares himself among himself is unwise. I don't think anybody woke up this morning and goes, you know what? I want to be unwise today. I just want to be duh. I don't think anybody did, but yet we do. Our behaviors get caught up in a space of comparison. And when you do that, you're unwise. Many times I'll be looking in the mirror and I'll be struggling with thoughts. And all of a sudden it's, it's a space of you know, comparison or what I could have done or I should have done or maybe I... And all of a sudden I look in the mirror and go, you're being unwise. You're being unwise. Point number one, you had a bad example of a father. You had a bad example. Now, the many, many different reasons for that, I don't want to get into that. I, don't, I mean, we need to forgive, but here's one way we respond when we have a bad example of a father. And this is the way many, this, is, this isn't Pastor Ron's theology here. This is behavioral, you know, this is behavioral, what people do when they've had a bad father. Many people get caught in this. You refuse to act like that. You become anti-identification. I'm going to be the exact opposite. You become incredibly discouraged. You're angry. You're enraged and given to addictions because you have become what you hate. So today, if that's you, maybe, maybe, that, maybe you're a lady in our house today and you're upset because you had a bad example of a father then come to the throne of God. Don't fight this. You're in this wilderness. It's not your fault that you were in that environment. But it will be your fault if you respond to that wrong environment and stay there. Make the right choice. Humble yourself to God in that space. So if you've had a bad example of a father and you struggle with discouragement, you struggle with addictions, you struggle with being angry and enraged, then come to the throne and say, God, I'm sorry. I struggle with these things. I give it to you. You are my heavenly father. Help me open up to you, heavenly father. You can be changed in the way you think and the experience. Or you had no example of a father. You had no example. You strive to be like a dad, but you often feel like a failure. Prone to pleasing people, depression, self-sabotage. Constantly in need of encouragement and have too often pity parties. I'm sorry, that's a good... I'm, I'm sorry, let me strike that from your thoughts right now. That's a, that's a good example of a father. A, you had no example. You are confused to what a father's supposed to look like. You're prone to feeling disappointed, often have failed expectations. After placing trust in multiple people you, you, who you thought could represent a father to you, and you keep on finding yourself empty. If that's you, struggling with disappointment, failed expectations, trying to figure out what a father is supposed to be like or what it would be like to have a father relationship. You can have one with a heavenly father today. A good example. So you can have a great example of a father. This can happen even as you have as a good example. You strive to be like him. 
you often feel like a failure. You're prone to pleasing people, depression, self-sabotage, constantly in need of encouragement, and have often pity parties. Here's how you can help yourself do that. If you are focused on the good, and that does not mean that you're focused on God, you, you could be comparing yourself and say, well, I had a, a good dad. Not a perf- no one's perfect. And you could be focused on trying to be who you are. Be who you are in God. Or maybe you're in need of a fatherly example. This is a point for single moms out there too. Those who don't have a father for their children, who are at a loss, what to do for their kids. God is always wanting to send a message that he has not left. He's never left us. He's never forsaken us. But remember, God is spirit. And those who love him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I'll never forget, you know, one of the things that when I first got saved, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's hanging out with them. You might say like Moses, he's camping out with them and they're learning from his mannerisms. They're learning he's a healer, he's a teacher, he's a counselor, he's full of hope. He has this relationship with the Heavenly Father that they don't really understand. He understands things, they don't even know why. He was, he was raised as a carpenter, yet he knows how to fish better than they do. Put your net on that side. And so they're seeing all these things. He walks on water. I mean, the things that they're seeing Jesus do. And so they love him. Such a relationship. And so Jesus one day walks into the city. And, and of course, they want all of them to love their Jesus. How many want people to love their Jesus? So do I. And all of a sudden, they don't. They don't even want Jesus to be there. And they get angry upset to the point where they want to create a curse to have she bears come down and kill him like Elisha had and Jesus looks at him and goes you don't even know what spirit you are of see we can how quickly fathers mothers how quickly we can get in a space of rejection or we can get in a space of disappointment or we can get in a space of of hopelessness or anger, or malice. And we can be hanging out with Christ, and also the next thing you know, we're thinking in the wrong spirit of things. And Jesus looks at him and goes, you're not acting like me at all. You're completely in the wrong spirit. I have found myself there so many times. And I, have, I realize that my wife can't get me in the right spirit. My children can't get me in the right spirit. My church family can't get me in the right spirit. The only way I can get there is spending time with a Holy Spirit. Taking time, resetting, getting a reset in my life. So today, as we take communion, I'm praying for that reset. Whether you're a father, whether you're a mother, whether you're a daughter, whether you're a son, whatever you're at in any situation, I guarantee you in somewhere in the message today, something hit home. You couldn't have everything that we said and something didn't hit home. And that's okay. Because God says this, what could, here's here's Isaiah um, talking to God in this last chapter. The man that seen so many prophetic things and he's having this last inspired moment with God and God and him are talking and God goes what could you really do Isaiah that would really impress me you know and to be honest with you my my kids all impress me yet they probably think they don't but they all do they all got such great gifts they excel in areas I don't. And, and that doesn't intimidate me. It totally excites me to see who they are in Christ. And yet many times, I don't care how old they can be, they could be 40 years old and they still want their father's acceptance. <laughs> doesn't matter how that is. We, are, we literally are born 
inside of us to want a father's acceptance but that's meant to go to him where it's pure our heavenly father he calls us accepted he calls us adopted he calls us his own amen that's who he calls us and so as we take communion it's because of what Jesus did that blood or that that juice we drink and that body or that bread that cracker that Jesus and his body was broke so that you could have an acceptable moment camping with your Heavenly Father that's all he wants just as you are and as you're whether you're I have no idea what a walking some more is but anyway so as you're having your walking some more or, or you're having your moment if the tears come today because you didn't have a fatherly situation I know that my father my my dad his dad died at 52 I believe years old and I know he missed him and I know that it broke him and to know that that has a, a space of, of shaping what ifs in his life. And sometimes what happens is, is when things in the wilderness happen that are hurtful, harmful, we can get indifferent, we can get angry, we can become uh, literally disappointed, we can have all kinds of wrong spiritual spaces of direction your heavenly father has only one desire for you look unto him who is the author and the finisher of who you are I can say over and over to my own kids you know what I know I failed you and I'm okay realizing that because I'm forgiven I also know that I have changed that I'm a better dad and a better grandfather than I've ever been. I also know there's a lot more room to grow. That excites me. I'm excited to be a better father in the future, a better grandfather. I'm truly sorry for my kids and my grandkids that I had to deal with some of my shortcomings. But I'm going to aim at a heavenly father. I'm going to take communion. I'm going to camp out with a holy, awesome father in heaven who's going to teach me his ways and, in, and literally live and move and have his way through my life so that I don't act. Yeah, this, this, the other day, I'm not a fisherman. You'll know that I don't catch nothing. But anyway, I was out hanging out in the lake this week and just my time with God. And I was realizing, I'm reading this book right now. It's a Christian novel. And it, says, it basically talks about this, this romance you can have with your wife. And that as Jesus is to his bride, so is a husband to his wife. And I'm sitting there realizing my fallacies. And I've learned this about God. People of God, every time I've given something to God, it always gets worse before it gets better when you give something to God it's going to get it, it get, why you say well why does that happen because you're not dead yet you came to him wounded and God wants you to be dead to that hurt and that frustration he wants you to let go of all of it so that you, you surrender it and then it's all him that rises up and some of us we're just like we we, we'll, we really struggle a long ways communion is a death to yourself and living to him would you rise up right now stand up father I pray your spirit I pray your hand upon this house I pray right now as we take communion Lord I even think of Nova who's part of our church family who's going through some real physical struggles God daddy be in that home right now 
others, Lord, that are we're struggling right now in this moment where we have reflection of time, absentee father, abusive father, maybe a great father, whatever it might be. Lord Jesus, you are a perfect example of a relationship with a heavenly father. You lived on this earth and you reached out to a heavenly dad. You were God incarnate, and yet you still reached out to a heavenly Father. God, I pray that everyone in this house, that we would not be in hindered, we would not hinder our life. Shame wouldn't have a place. Past wouldn't have a place. God, I pray we come to you broken and contrite, not with everything that we've tried to be. But God, we just come to you, even as Adam and Eve came here naked, Nothing came in this. God, I pray that we could come to you that way. I ask that you would move in this communion time with you. That you'd heal. I pray that there would be healing that would go on in men and women's lives. I pray that we would walk out of this house different. I pray that we have new spaces of camping out with you. New tendencies, new intentionality of spending time as we go through this wilderness. You are our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's have communion together. Let's worship. Let's get to this altar. Let's commune with our God, our Heavenly Father.